<laughs> Hello and welcome to the third instalment of our HSE Half Hour. So um, my name is Lauren, I'm the Head of Networks and Communications here at Executive Network Group. Um, myself, my colleague Laura, who I'm joined with today, um, are going to be bringing you this half hour live show every month on all things recruitment and safety. So um, Laura, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, hello. I'm Laura Orcott. I am Associate Director for HTC Recruitment and Executive Network Group. Um, and, yeah, looking forward to the session today. Should be a good one, I think. <laughs> yeah. I agree. So um, as Head of Networks at e and I work close with Laura and our health and safety team um, and myself and the team look at research, creating white papers on safety industry trends, information for our clients, basically. Um, and we'd like to share this with our wider LinkedIn network, hence the session. So um, this is an interactive and live session today. So any questions that you have, please pop in the comment box. I will try and get to them throughout as Laura's kind of answering my questions and we can go from there. <laughs> so um, for the third installment of this show today, we are discussing diversity and safety. So this is based on our findings from two reports, um, the first being a gender diversity report that was published late last year, um, and also our remuneration report, which was, uh, I suppose, generated this year. So data sample sizes, we had around 500 people for the diversity survey and around um, 1,500 people, you know, responded to our remuneration report. So um Today, we'll go through some of that data. We'll discuss what diversity and safety is looking like at the moment, any trends, and some kind of tips as well. So, um, Laura, should we start off with the diversity, uh, the gender diversity yeah. um, survey, if you could give us an overview? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I am pretty interested in the, in diversity, uh, very, very interested in, in diversity across all the protected characteristics, but also massively so on gender diversity. So um, I'm part of the UK Women in Safety Network, and I also sit on the communications team for uh, One Wish. Um, now, I don't know if everyone knows One Wish, but One Wish is basically the global network of all the women in safety groups. So we've got people from the UK, we've got groups from Singapore, from America, um, you know, basically all over the world. Um, and this gender diversity survey that we did last year, we did in conjunction with One Wish. And it was a really, really interesting topic, um, you know, and stuff that we just kind of wanted to get a bit more data around. Mm -hmm. You know, I think anecdotally, a lot of us feel that there probably is a gender disparity within the industry but uh, i am always a big believer in having data is <laughs> very very helpful you know you don't know what to do about a situation unless we know the actual facts so um that's where this this survey came about and this is why we did it so um i don't know lauren if you could actually share page four of our gender diversity survey yes so yeah, perfect um... So this um, this graph is basically the first question that we asked as part of this survey. And, and that question was, you know, do you as a professional in the industry feel that there is an issue with gender disparity in the workplace? You know, mm -hmm. it's good to just see what our, our network um, feels. And, and as you said, Lauren, this is about 500 people, isn't it? The, the it is yes yeah so we collected the data it was anonymous but this went out across our linkedin network um it went out via kind of um an email survey as well and we kind of collected the results and, and put it within this report perfect so um i don't think any of us were massively surprised by <laughs> the information that came back on this on this first question so look the data pretty clearly shows there is a perceived gap in the industry, you know, two thirds of our respondents felt that there was an imbalance in the companies that they worked for in the safety industry as a whole. Um, you know, health and safety has been predominantly a male dominated industry for quite a number of years. And don't get me wrong, the tide is changing. You know, it's great to see all these fantastic female safety professionals coming coming to the forefront. But um, I think there is still some way to go. And, and this data kind of backed that up that, you know, a lot of people still feel that there is still quite a big gap. Um, yeah. in terms of, of men and women in, in the safety industry. Um, one thing I thought that was quite interesting, though, that I wanted to bring up is since we uh, have, since we did this survey um, and, you know, we've come back after the pandemic and, you know, things have kind of got back to normal or, or the new normal, um, we've actually found that our shortlists at the moment and, and moving forward are way more diverse than they were, than they were before the pandemic. Um, and I think that's actually a direct response 
to uh, to COVID. So we do have um, something, you know, to, to thank COVID for. And basically, the reasoning behind this is, you know, the pandemic massively forced us to change the way that we did things. You know, loads of people were forced to to work from home. Loads of companies were forced to think of ways that their staff could work flexibly and not in the office and you know stuff they just hadn't considered before and, and we were the same weren't we Lauren you know we'd never yes. worked from home <laughs> until <Yes. laughs> yeah until the pandemic and then all of a sudden you know you were forced to do it um and coming back out of you know the lockdowns and things like that what's great is a lot of companies now are sticking to that you know they found that this worked really really well people were happier people were more productive so they're sticking with that sort of hybrid working that flexible working and what that means is we can be more diverse with the people that we're putting forward in shortlists, because yeah. if you think about, um, you know, women trying to get back into industry after maybe, you know, being out for a few years with with kids or whatever it is, they do sometimes struggle because they can't do the standard nine to five Monday to Friday in the office. That's that's just yeah. not a possibility. I mean, we all know how expensive childcare is at the moment, right? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. yes. So, um, so the nine to five Monday to Friday just doesn't work for a lot of women. But because companies have now changed their perspectives on home working and flexible working, what it means is we can get them to consider people that they just wouldn't have thought of before, people they would have discounted before. So um, yeah, although, you know, this is this is from last year, I think we'd be quite interested to do this survey again next year and see, yeah. you know, what, what the gap is. Um, I think there still will be a gap, but hopefully it, it might be starting to close a little bit, you know, because, be of, nice. because of those things, yeah. 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 So a couple of questions that we've had. Um, so oh, already, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so firstly, someone's asked what kind of region this is covering. Um, mm -hmm. So within the kind of gender diversity survey, this was put out to our HC network. So this was predominantly around perception. So what do people perceive the industry to look like? And this is across the safety industry. It was predominantly UK based. Yeah, and um, we did have some international kind of input on this as well. Um, I wouldn't like to say what region it definitely covered but it was predominantly UK and our remuneration report is definitely UK focused um, and we have a new report of that coming out in Jan so to move on to the next question um, what do you think is the biggest challenge for women starting out in the safety industry and how can business leaders overcome it? Wow we are going straight to the hard hitting stuff today yeah. aren't we? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, you know we've only got half an hour today but th there's there's lots of challenges Let, let's not um, you know beat around the bush here there's lots of different things that that make it quite or can make it difficult as a woman in industry um that first one um I think we're starting to cover and that first is you know the hours and flexible working things like that so that's good the second biggest challenge for um for a lot of women in industry tends to be around um perception in industry um and what I mean by that is you know Obviously, we've come a huge way in terms of feminism and, and the way that people are perceived, but particularly when we've got women going into like male dominated industries like construction and stuff like that, um, it sometimes can be a bit of a struggle. Um, so I think, you know, that sometimes is quite difficult for women that are new into the industry to um, to get to grips with, you know, to go in and realise that actually pay, maybe people aren't listening to them or you know something like that because of of their gender i think that's quite shocking when you're you're new to industries um and i'm sure you know i'm not alone here it's pretty much happened to all women that i know is that you know you go to a meeting you're new to the company you're quite young and the first thing they do is they ask you to make them a cup of tea right because <laughs> that's that's what they think you're there for so uh, that that's a really really big challenge so one of the things i'm quite passionate about is trying to build confidence of younger women um, and getting them to really, really understand um, that although, you know, there are gender differences, that doesn't that doesn't have to be a problem. Uh, if you go in with the right attitude and you go in with the right approach, um, we can kind of counter to that. So that's an interesting question and we could talk about it for days. So. Yeah, it is. It is really interesting. Now, I've got to point out John here in the comments did make a, a good point on that, Laura, that, you know, sometimes as women they might not have had exposure especially in like high risk yeah. industries like your construction some people come from the tools don't they they may have started out within construction kind of moved over to safety in some form of their career got qualified and moved on so they've got the hands-on experience as such mm -hmm. and that's not to say women don't have the same experience but maybe less likely so I thought yeah. that was an interesting point to raise that is a good point yeah absolutely so thank, thank you I love that people are getting involved already this is really really good <laughs> yeah. um I don't know, Lauren, if you could share the next graph for me, please, as well. Um, so this was page five of our gender diversity report. Um, and this was around perception of 
female representation at a senior level. So we just wanted to see, again, uh, within the safety industry, do people feel that they are being represented? You know, do they see people that look like them at a senior level, running companies, things like that? Um, interestingly, I was actually recording a session yesterday for Nibosh Conference, um, which will be live next week, by the way. People can go and check it out, but uh, around sort of diversity and things like that. And uh, one of the facts that I, I found when I was researching for this was that there are only 21 female CEOs in the Fortune 500. So, you know, I, I, we were, again, kind of assuming that maybe this would be an issue and people would say, look, yeah, we don't feel represented at a senior level. Um, the good news is that it wasn't all bad news. <laughs> so yeah. if you look at the graph, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, a massive majority of people saying, um, you know, we, we don't feel represented. But 40 percent of people still were saying, yeah, look, it, it's not good enough. Um, mm -hmm. We don't see a lot of senior people at um you know in ceo positions and things like that that are female or who look like you know look like me and you yeah definitely and i think you know um, we have had some more kind of comments come through which is great um firstly from marisa you know we are very far behind in construction she says when it comes mm -hmm. to diversity so even things like to base basic welfare provision we will get onto tips and i know that we're not going into i suppose industry industry specifics at this point but it is good to recognize you know i think the report here did cover a lot of different industries didn't it laura your, your yeah. construction your manufacturing right through to kind of third kind of public sector um, and paul has mentioned you know that there's potentially still a problem where there's very little diversity in an organization organization overall not just hsc so oh god yeah 100 percent. this is not yeah this is not a, a problem just for the safety industry at all um but you know it's it's a good enough place to start i guess for, for us to look at <laughs> yeah definitely so you know it's it seems that it isn't all bad news but you know i think it's fair to say that the majority do still feel that there's not enough female representation yeah. at a senior level so um why does this kind of matter then laura how does this, you know why does it matter but really what how does this impact the industry you know how does gender disparity between men and women how does this impact safety yeah really good question and again something we could talk about for days so i will i'll try and i'll try and uh, smidge this down for us but um like i said look people like to see themselves where they work you know they like to see themselves reflected because that makes people feel included um, yeah. So again, you know, this is this is wider than gender diversity. This is diversity. You know, if we if we don't see people that look like us represented at senior level, we mm -hmm. don't feel um, you know like a, a valuable part of the the workplace, um, yeah. and that's really really powerful. So that's obviously you know there's a lot of of moral ethical reasons for it um what i thought i would bring up though is actually the business commerciality reasons because i think these are quite interesting and. Mm -hmm. Um, often the you know the commerciality aspect of it this is how you push this sort of stuff through <laughs> with yeah. with your bosses so I, I always think it's an interesting angle on it so um there was a recent study from McKinsey and Co that was a couple of years ago that basically found that companies that were in uh, the top quartile for gender diversity in their executive teams were actually outperforming their competitors by 25 percent you know, so this is no coincidence that when they had more gender diverse leadership teams, they were more profitable. And what they found was actually the greater the representation, the greater that that outperformance was. And mm -hmm. um, when you step away from gender and you look at diversity as a whole, the numbers got even bigger. So um, they found that companies that had more ethnically diverse boards and senior leadership teams actually were 36 percent more profitable. Than their mm -hmm. capacity so these these aren't small numbers that we're talking mm -hmm. about here you know these are these are genuine impacts <laughs> from from changing changing the board and changing the leadership you know it's it's almost impossible to ignore from a commercial point of view even if you have a completely unethical unmoral <laughs> you know board that doesn't want to co consider it from a, from a moral point of view you know the bottom line is mm -hmm. if you want to be in business and you want to be competitive you've got to look at this you know we have to start looking at, at gender and, and diversity um and the reason for that is pretty simple you know if you for example have 10 clones on your board and they all come from the same background they all come from the same culture they all study at the same you know sort of universities um they all tend to have the same outlook on things 
you know you yeah. get the same ideas that if if you want to be profitable and you want to outperform your competitors you've got to be fresh you've got to be innovative mm-hmm. and you've got to understand your audience as well um you know if you've got a company that is trying to market something to people in Latin America and you have no Latin American representation <laughs> on your board, chances are you're getting it wrong. So yeah, um, yeah it, it's absolutely really, really vitally important that that this is something that companies look at. Um, and the other thing that I think is quite interesting with it is we know there's a skills shortage in the safety industry. Um, yeah. as, as someone sort of alluded to um, earlier, you know, a lot of people in safety tended to come to it as a second career, right? You know, they were other tools first, then they yeah. became health and safety, um, which means, you know, they're they're starting to, to get older. Um, not writing you all off, by the way, you know, you've got many, many years left in you. But but there is an absolute gap. We cannot yeah. bring enough people in as quick as people are coming out of the industry. And again, the pandemic did exacerbate that because a yeah. lot of people work from home during the pandemic. They spent loads of time with their families and they thought, oh God, yeah, you know, what, what am I working for? And a lot of people retired early and have, have, have gone part-time or have changed, you know, their, their approach to work. Um, and this is going to be a problem. And if we want to attract the youth, it's been proven again that we need to look at these sorts of things because the younger generations are very, very ethical. They're very, very interested in, in diversity. Mm-hmm. They're interested in making sure that they're working with companies that have got fair cultures, you know, and have got representation. Um, yes. And they, again, you know, we always like to try and back this up with with some figures for you. So PwC uh, actually did a driving social mobility survey um, on this again, one or two years ago. And um, they were looking at what different groups of people thought was the biggest sort of barrier to them in the workforce. Um, and the 55 and over kind of category said they thought the biggest barrier to them in the workforce was, um, you know, their skills, their education. It was stuff that they could learn. That would kind of be the biggest barrier. But when they looked at the 18 to 34 year olds, the, you know, the picture was just massively different. Um, it was something like 24% said that they thought their ethnicity was going to be a problem. It was going to be a barrier to them in the workplace. Um, 27% said their gender was probably going to be a barrier to them in the workplace. Uh, where they grew up was something that came up. They thought that might be an issue, yeah. disabilities. Yeah, so you can you can see by this, this is the stuff that they care about. You know, this is the stuff that they're really, really interested in. So um, if we want to fill that fill that skills gap and attract people to the safety industry, which I hope we all do, um, they need to know that the safety industry is a fair industry, right? Um, yeah, and that they're going to be treated fairly. They're going to be given the right opportunities um, and that, you know, their, their ethics and their morals are kind of taken into consideration. So, yeah, yeah interesting stuff. Very much so. And I think, you know, from I know you touched on it there about social mobility, but from a talent attraction standpoint, you know, Mm. if a company does look like clones and it's that echo (laughs) chain feel without, you know, that innovation and different outlooks and different opinions, nothing's going to change for them internally or externally for, for clients. But also, you know, really especially kind of Gen Z is that they're kind of labelled are very much aligned with their own kind of morals and ethics. And if that isn't displayed with diversity, not just diversity, but an inclusive environment, not just a tick box. Yeah. Of the BAME community and safety, it needs to be, okay, what provisions are we making when we actually hire these people? Are they feeling included, welcomed? Mm-hmm. Are we kind of changing the status quo throughout the business? So I think there's a, a much wider kind of discussion there that, as you say, we could talk about for hours. But <laughs> we could do about days, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that leads me on to my next question, really, Laura. So implementing a DNI strategy, then it's not as easy as kind of putting it pen on paper and going, right, this is our strategy, let's roll it out. But it's not all bad news. So I think, you know, from some of our reports, there has been um, a difference in opinion where people are saying right it's starting to become a little bit more inclusive and we are seeing different people join the industry so what are the solutions for safety in particular how can we remove the bias how can we appeal to a wider audience whether that's women in safety different ethnicities you know different ages how can we appeal to these people you know all the protected characteristics basically okay again a very big question for me to answer in about 
five <laughs> five yeah. minutes so I'll, <laughs> I'll let if anyone wants to ask me more about this afterwards please feel free but there's loads and loads of different things you can do when you're looking at dni strategies and looking at ways to um to attract you know more diverse people to the company um i'll just give you a couple of the top ones so um one thing that a lot of companies tend to look at is blind cvs so mm -hmm. um, a blind cv basically is where you take the person's name off it right yeah um and the idea with that is that you can't get any clues from the name of, you know, what gender they are, what ethnicity they are, that sort of thing. And it should sort of cut out unconscious bias. Yeah. Um, that often doesn't go far enough, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because even if you take someone's name off their CV, by looking at someone's CV, you can usually get a pretty good idea because you can look at, um, you know, when their first job was to figure out kind of, you know, how old they were. You can figure out, you know, probably um, things about their culture by looking at schools they went to, areas they lived in, um, even stuff like the way that people talk can give away their gender. You know, there's loads and loads of different things that can spark. And I'm not saying it sparks conscious bias at all, but it, it can spark that unconscious bias when, mm -hmm. when people are looking at CVs. So one thing that um, companies have started doing one step ahead of blind CVs is just taking CVs out of the equation altogether. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so some some of our clients um, they don't even want to see CVs. They tell us right, we've got interview slots. These are the dates and times. You just put people in it, and we'll and we'll talk to them on the day. Um, and yeah. that's really really good because that is that's making sure their unconscious bias isn't getting involved. You know, we're just putting the right people for the job in front of them, and they interview them on the day. Mm -hmm. And it's okay, who does the best on the day? So that yeah. that works really really well. Um, another another thing we've done. So some clients want to go actually the exact opposite way and get more clarity of the people that they're seeing. Um, so they get us to do video interviews that we send over with their CVs. Mm -hmm. And what happens then is if they've got hiring managers um, that are viewing these these videos, these CVs, what we can do is we can kind of track the data and see, mm -hmm. okay, at what point did this person disengage from that video? So we can see if, for example, we send them three men and one woman, and they watch all the men's videos to the end, but they only watch the first 10 seconds of the woman's one, that can maybe alert to the company that there's there's some unconscious or conscious bias going on there that we need to address. Um, so that's quite an interesting idea as well. Um, yeah. The other thing that I always think is really, really important is we have to look at the ways that we're attracting people. So mm -hmm. um, someone used a really good example to me once, and it's always stuck in my head, is that say you always advertise your roles by putting an advert out in the Times. You're mm -hmm. only ever going to get a certain sort of person respond to that. You know, yeah. you're only ever going to get someone who reads the Times that responds to that. You're not getting a yeah. diverse pool. So, you know, your HR might be saying, we need more diverse applicants. And you're saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm not discounting them. I, I would encourage loads of dis diverse people to, to apply. But they might not even be seeing but not getting them in the first place. Yeah, exactly. They're not even seeing the yeah. advert. They don't even know the job exists. So you kind of got to look at, at that aspect and think, okay, are we making sure that everybody's got fair access to the information? Mm -hmm. Um, which is which is interesting. And and there's loads of different ways around that, whether we look at, you know, different kinds of social media, whether you look at advertising in different um, you know, different newspapers, different job boards, all these sorts of things are, are worth kind of looking at. Yeah. Um and then the final thing that is is usually one of the bigger issues is just perception of industry and perception of your company. So, yeah. for example, if you are in the construction industry and you want to attract more women or, um, you know, more ethnically diverse people, um, sometimes they struggle because the construction industry has a reputation as being a bit blokey and a bit, you know, uh, it's got it's got kind of that banter element to it. And that sometimes puts people off applying. Um, mm -hmm. So we have to kind of look at ways to change that perception. So uh, one that I always use as a great example is Kia. So um, Kia, obviously, a massive, massive construction company, really, really well known. And they started taking part in Pride and having a huge float and, uh, you know, having all their uh, LGBTQ plus um, employees come and get involved. And um, they got quite a lot of stick, I think, when they first started doing this. And people were saying, you know, why is a company got a Pride float? What's that got to do with anything? It's got loads to do with it because yeah. what you what you're saying there is you're saying, look, we welcome people, we're inclusive, you know, mm -hmm. you're we're a company that you can apply to. We were very, very happy to have you. Um, so yeah, perception is a huge one. And again, yeah. could talk about that today.
Right. Yeah. Now, I think to add in as well there, Laura, I think, you know, especially with talking about the, the CVs and the blind CVs and, you know, even into the interviewing process, that's got to be looked at, you know, let's yeah. remove bias there, let's focus on competency, let's focus on data as well, um, yeah. as opposed to kind of, right, let's just go off gut feel and that unconscious bias of, oh, I went to school there and so did they. So, you know, <laughs> that, that'll be great here. And, you know, it, people go after that familiarity as opposed mm -hmm. to, what can work and I think a couple of people have said here in the comments you know people's health and safety teams in every organization you know there's understanding human factors of risk you know for that you do need different people you know to, to make that a success so um I think you know that the next part of this and as we're coming to the last part of our half hour Laura um, you know yeah, yeah. That's really <laughs> so shall we talk um about any other kind of protected characteristics that we looked at especially yeah. in the remuneration report if I just pull that up yeah if you could share um the director level one yeah that's yeah. great actually yeah there we, we go um, we haven't got loads of time to go through this, um, only a few minutes, so I'll just give you the headlines of this. What we found when we did the remuneration report this year is we asked people to um, give us information about who they were. They didn't have to. It was completely anonymised. But what it did is it just gave us some data about numbers of people in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. So at least, again, if you've got data, you can do something with it. You've got yeah. some information to work with. Um, the good news was we found at the lower levels, the um, percentages of people with protected characteristics, they kind of tracked the UK averages. Actually, they weren't that bad. So it yeah. looks like we, we are doing a decent job at the moment of, of bringing people into the industry. So that's really, really good news. Um, where that fell apart <laughs> was when we got to the senior level and it yes. just completely fell apart. Um, so that is exactly what we're talking about, about that you know representation at a senior level. Um, and why that's so important, I think that's something that we should be, be focusing on. So um, just to run you through some of the stats really, really quickly, um, we found that from our report, percentage of women at senior level was 4% and male was 96%. Massive disparity there. Yeah. In terms of ethnicity, 91% said white, 9% said other. We had no one who identified as black or Asian come back at a senior level. Um, sexuality, 90% straight. We had 5% gay woman, 5% gay man. Um, so again, not ideal. You know, we could definitely do with working on those numbers. Um, religion was uh, mostly Christian, about 50% Christian. Um, we had no Jewish respondents, no Muslim respondents. We had uh, like 4% Buddhist, interestingly um and then 39 percent just said no religion affiliation whatsoever um yeah. and then the final one we asked them about was disability and uh 91 percent said they had no disability at a senior level nine percent said they did but they had a hidden disability um which you know could be anything that could be like for example i'm diabetic so that's to me is a, is a hidden disability um and nobody came back and said they had a visible dis disability at a senior level so this for me is where it gets really really interesting you know it, it it's good news obviously we are we are attracting people into the industry and we need to keep working on that and keep making sure that we're we're putting that perception out there to, to bring more mm -hmm. in but you know it all seems to be falling apart when it comes to promoting people into senior level and hopefully that will change you know over the years yeah as, as we're bringing yeah. more people in you know we're giving them opportunities to um but if you think that this was a sample this survey of 1500 professionals across the uk um you know, I, we would just expect to see much higher percentages. And I think yeah. that was that was quite worrying, particularly the fact that we had no no black, no Asian, no Muslim professionals respond at a senior level. Yeah, um, definitely. Even though it was a, a sample of like fifteen hundred people, wasn't it, Laura? That's still, yeah. you know, a very shocking stat to put it in. Is, so yeah. As we kind of um end this, you know, HC half hour, we hope you've enjoyed a couple of action points I've taken definitely is it isn't just the attraction with a diverse people within safety but it's how a company can create an inclusive culture so having an advocate at different levels whether that be female leadership whether that be you know um having people from different ethnicities represented in safety as someone rightly pointed out you know it takes all different views of safety especially with risk assessments and influencing others you know as I say if you've just got an echo chamber and everyone's looking and saying yeah. the same, you're not really going to create any difference so you know the flexible work and the adaptive working thinking outside of the box that 
again hugely attracts them as Laura rightly said we've seen a huge uptake of that after the pandemic mm-hmm. um, so yeah that that's kind of a couple of action points that I've taken so um, Laura what are we discussing for the next safety half hour? Uh, so, Lauren, we won't be dis- discussing anything, I'm afraid. So, yeah, so, uh, I am actually going on a sabbatical. So I'm going travelling for the next two months. Uh, so uh, as of next week, yeah, uh, I'm afraid you won't be hearing from me till January. Doesn't mean the HSC half hours are going away. So, uh, Lauren, I believe you are pulling in my co-director, Chris, aren't you? Uh, next month. Yeah, and uh, that's to talk about talent attraction. It is, yes, a talent attraction to the safety industry and what we can do. I know we touched on some points there today. So that is going to happen um, next month. Don't know the date as yet, but <laughs> next month towards the mid to end of November, that, that is going to take place. So yeah. thank you very much um, for, for everyone joining today. If anyone would like to see those reports, whether that be our remuneration report or our gender disparity report we released last year give us a shout and we're happy to share those um and yeah thank you very much thank you guys bye thanks bye bye